So I want you to listen to the words, um, and I'll begin reading in verse 27, Luke 6, 27. And I want you to listen to the words, and he says here in verse 27, but I say to you, to you who will hear, love your what? Oh, my, we could just stop right there. It's, it's already too much. How many of y'all say we've already done too much? That's, you done already messed me up already. It says, love your what? Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who spitefully disrespect and use you. Mm. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic as well. Give to everyone who asks of you. Give to everyone who asks of you. Give to what? I was hoping y'all version said something different. Okay. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them, do not ask them for it back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also must do likewise. Lord have mercy. I'll stop there because I don't think we can handle any more. Today for the next couple weeks, I want to meditate on the topic, what makes us distinct? Turn to your neighbor and say, being distinct is overrated. <laughs> Tell your other neighbor, I'll see you in four weeks when this is over. Let us pray. God of grace and mercy, God of the ages, we thank you for your word. For we declare it is truth, that it is wisdom, that it is light, it is instructive, and we commit ourselves to following it each and every day. Thank you, O oh God, for the times that we have been obedient, and forgive us, O oh God, for the times that we have turned away from your word. We thank you, O oh God, that you made your word available to us. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, you are our rock, you are our strength, you are our redeemer, and you are show enough a friend. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. A young woman who's in therapy with her therapist for the past several months is talking with her therapist about one of her enemies, an enemy that she cannot stand, but an enemy she sees every day. This enemy, enemy, enemy is around her work, is around her family, and has great influence on her children. This enemy in her life is one who has brought her great stress, great um, pain, and great sorrow. She wants to get away from this particular enemy, but seems like she can't because that enemy is so involved in her life. And the enemy in which she's talking to her therapist about is her husband. They work in a similar field, so they interact with each other. They obviously live in the same house, and they share their three children. And it is just incredibly difficult. And this therapist, who happens to be a Christian therapist, began to talk about the importance of her living out a loving relationship with her husband, whether they stay together or not. And her response simply was this. She says, how can I love somebody I hate? How can I love someone who has caused me so much pain? How can I even begin to fathom doing good to someone who has caused me so much harm? Listen now. My friend who I'm talking about ain't the only one that has some of those kind of questions. 
anyone other than me and my friend have asked some serious questions of their therapist, of their friend, of their pastor, of their neighbor, of their, come on somebody, I'm the only one. Oh, the rest of y'all can't say nothing because y'all sitting next to your enemy. Okay, I got it. I got it. I knew, I knew it had to be, had to be something. And, it, and it's interesting, and it's interesting, it's interesting because Jesus had done some incredible things up until this point in the gospel according to Luke. Luke, we know, who is a physician who concentrated on the miraculous healings of the sick and also who is a historian who is detail-oriented and made sure that things happen in a chronological order. Luke was a physician and a historian. He also was the author of the book of Acts. And now he begins to take a snippet from um, the Levitical codes, a snippet from the Deuteronomy codes. He takes a snippet from the laws and the lessons that were taught on the Sermon on the Mount, and he now has summoned his disciples to what they call a level place, uh, 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 to the plains, and he begins to teach them these things. And the first thing he teaches them on this level plain, on this, on this, on this solid, you didn't get it, he was on a mountain, he takes them down to a plain. In other words, he wants everyone to know that this is for everyone, everyone and that everyone is on equal footing with these laws that he's getting ready to share with you all. You didn't get it. Let me tell you what I'm trying to tell you, Sister Bowman. What I'm trying to say, that this ain't a rule just for the pastor. That, that, that this teaching ain't just for the deacons and the ministers. It's for anyone who says that they are a follower of Jesus Christ. Are you all with me? And at this point, he begins to tell them, some things that would mess them up. The first thing he, he tells them is that he says, I want you to know that you are to love your enemies. He says, I want you to pray for your enemies. He says, I want you to do good for your enemies. He says, and when they dog you out, he says, and they slap you on one cheek, he says, give them the other cheek so they can slap that one too. <laughs> and, and the question is, and many things, many times I've learned this over the years, is that oftentimes it's not the what the Bible says, it's why the Bible says it. Why would he teach us this? Why would he tell a bunch of folks who, are, who have given up everything to follow him that they would be perse- they're being persecuted, they're being talked about, people are going around saying, Yo, your friends done left, your family members done left and following this Jesus dude who says he's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's doing his father's business. We ain't seen no throne. We ain't seen no crown. And we ain't seen no evidence that he's royal at all. As a matter of fact, we've seen just the opposite. He's hanging around folks that are acting crazy, sinners and drunkards. He's hanging out with the exact opposite people that a king would hang out with. And yet your boys left all that they had to follow this coop, this crazy man who's running around talking about he's the son of God. And then he has these strange teachings. He says, he says that he wants us to live according to the spirit and not of the flesh. He tells us that, that, that how we feel is not how he wants us to act. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you these couple things that I'm going to get out of here. As a matter of fact, true Christians, true followers of the Lord, don't act in emotion. They act outside of how they feel, even if they feel like doing something. How many of y'all have felt like cussing someone out before? Just once. Just, let me see. How many of y'all have felt like slapping somebody? How many of y'all have felt like slapping and cussing them out? This morning. And oftentimes, look, and I, I promise, I'm going to give you a couple of things and I'm going to get out of here. I'm just going to give you two. I got four, but I'm going to give you two today. I'll give you two next week. And what I want you all to understand is that one of the biggest mistakes that we make in love is that we think love has something to do with feelings. Love has very little to do with feelings. As a matter of fact, the only reason I know the story about the young lady who I told you about is that I had a conversation with her. and She said, can you believe my therapist had the nerve to tell me this? And as I reiterated what the therapist had said and, and supported what the therapist had said, um, she says, so you mean to tell me that love has nothing to do with feelings? 
She said, because I sure don't feel like doing nothing that you or my therapist has said. And then I tried to break it down in just common terms. Y'all know I'm a practitioner. I tried to break it down in common terms. I said, have you ever felt like getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning and changing your child's diaper? She says, no. She said, but I do it because I love them. I said, well, you just answered your own question. I said, I don't care how cute my babies are. They ain't so cute at 3 o'clock in the morning with a dirty diaper. Come on, somebody. The cuteness factor don't matter, but you do what you do. You clean up some stuff because it's good for them. It takes them out of a state of what's uncomfortable and what's irritable. Come on, somebody. And gives them something that is more comfortable so they can continue to be happy and healthy. Are you all with me? And so so the first thing that I want to share with you all is that he tells us that we are to love our enemies, and then it says, and it says to do good. Now listen, listen, to love our enemies and to do good. And when I was talking with this young lady, she says, well, he's a Christian too. How come, how come I got to be the one that's doing the loving? How many of y'all had that question too? How many of y'all say, you know, why I got to be the one? So there was this great Spanish explorer who was looking for treasure. And, um, and this was a couple centuries ago, and they were exploring treasure in Peru, looking for this great wealth. And, um, and, and this great Spanish explorer, as he has this incredible army, this army of strong men that he was prepared, watch this, that anyone that would come against him, these, these, um, these warriors would be able to fend off anything that would come against him. They, he also had these great um, historians and, and, and architects and, and map readers and topography folks that could help them navigate any of the terrain. And even at the end of the army's um, um, brigade, at the end of the army troop, he had four chaplains that would pray for their success. So you got to get it. In the, in the front was this great explorer. Right behind him was this, these warriors who can handle anything. And behind them were the intellectual uh, capital that he needed to be able to read the maps and discover the importance and the value of the treasures by which he was searching. And at the very back, he had a couple chaplains that he threw in, a few chaplains that he threw in so that they could have this thing prayed for. When it get to this point between mountaintops where there was a bridge they had to cross. And the bridge was a thin rope from one side of the mountain to the other side of the mountain with just two other thin ropes that they had to walk across. This brave explorer looked and said, oh no, the devil is a lie. He stood back. He, he wanted to send his warriors ahead. The warriors looked and said, oh, no. They backed up and said, no. And even the intellectuals couldn't figure out how to cross this rope. And everybody looked at the chaplain and said, the church must go first on this matter. The chaplains, without hesitation, grabbed the rope and walked all the way across and led them to the other side. And when they all got to the other side, they, they said, Why were you so brave and why were you so bold to take this incredible journey across these little ropes? And they simply said this. One is that we've been called to lead the way. And two, we know that there's a great treasure on the other side. Come on, somebody. When you are one who follows Christ, we have been called to lead the way in love. And we know that when we love folks, there's a great treasure on the other side. Are you all with me on that? That didn't make sense to you all. Let me see if I can help you out a little, a little bit more. We are to lead in love, loving our enemies. And it's interesting because the context in which he's telling people, folks to love is those who are hated, those who are reviled, and those who are cast out. I want you to understand, most of the people who hate on you, most of the people who are your enemies, they are simply hurt people who are hurting people. Hurt people hurt people. I want you to pause for a moment. If you don't mind, just think about it for a moment. Think about someone at your job, someone in your home, someone in your life, someone in your family, someone in your community, someone in your circle of influence who always seems to be picking at you, always seems to be hating on you, always want to cause you problems. I guarantee you, if you think long enough or if you ask around enough, you'll see that that person is hurting. And they're taking their hurt out on you. 
erroneously or um, for a reason they think that you are the one who caused them that pain. But I guarantee you that, that they are hurting and they're acting out in a way and they're screaming for someone to love them. Let me give you an example. I was in, when I was in grad school in Atlanta, there was a young lady who we were very, really, really good friends. And this was when I was in the, um, the psychology program. So I wasn't in seminary. I had finished that, um, that training. And she didn't know I was a pastor. And she didn't know um, that I was formerly in seminary. And, and we were really cool friends. And she would hang out with Tanisha. And one day she found out that I was a pastor. And her whole attitude changed with me. I mean, she began to, it's like some of y'all. <laughs> I mean, uh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I'm just, did, that, did, that, did that actually come out my mouth? I don't know what that is. Anyway, anyway, the whole attitude changed. Listen, I mean, she, she began to talk big trash about me, and I was deeply hurt because we were cool. Dr. Hunter, we were friends, and, and she just began to just be just a pain in my backside, and I couldn't understand it. John, I couldn't understand why my friend would do me like that. And then finally... After some time, I pulled her to the side. I said, what's up? We used to hang. You don't, you don't call me on my cell phone no more, you know? And, and, and all this other kind of stuff. What's, what's going on with you? This is before cell phones. Y'all remember when they used to have night minutes and day minutes and free weekends? Yeah, yeah. That, this is, yeah, yeah, amen. You call me. You don't call me after seven no more, girl. Anyway, guess what? Let me tell you what happened to her. Let me tell you why she was so, so nasty towards me once she found out that I was a person of the cloth. When she was 16 years old, her best friend got pregnant. She was pregnant, got pregnant by a deacon in the church. They called the 16-year-old girl up to the front of the church. And they threw enough oil on her to fry chicken for a whole church. They, 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 they yelled every kind of evil verse you could possibly give someone at her. And she, remember, and she said, I remember thinking, if they're going to do that to her, boy, I'll wait till they get a hold of that deacon. The deacon was the brother-in-law of the pastor. They never said a word. He held his position. And she lost all respect for anyone in church leadership. Fast forward 10 years later, she was angry at me for what happened to her when she was 16 years old. What she did not need was me to respond to her the way that she responded to me. The Bible teaches us the power of treating others the way you want to be treated versus treating folks the way they treat you. Why? Because if everyone treats each other the way that you are treated when you're treated bad, the whole world will be hurting, wounded, and broken. And God has called us to be healers and people of encouragement. Amen? Amen. So the first thing is that we must love our enemies. Because love brings about transformation and healing. But the second thing that he tells us, tells his disciples, why I want you to love your enemies and to be around your enemies and to bless your enemies and do not curse, because we can learn from our enemies. Stop for a moment. How many of you all know that you can learn from your enemies? But the lessons that we often learn from our enemies are painful lessons. Listen to me, y'all, that not only must we love our enemies, but we also must learn, l- learn from our enemies. Um, I, I learned two things in life. I don't know about you all, um, Mr. King, I don't know if you learned this or not, but I learned that there are two people who are extremely truthful. Someone who's drunk Come on, somebody. How many, how many people, you know, speak nice oftentimes, but they get a little, little, little something up in them? That's why your daddy ain't your real daddy. What? (laughs) 
<laughs> Listen now. A drunk heart is often a truthful heart. But Therm also, an angry heart is often a truthful heart. You want to know what your spouse thinks? What you get when them heated arguments? The truth. T-R-U-F-A, the truth will come out. How many of y'all know that's the truth? And what happens is people who are, your, who are your enemy, people who are angry, people who don't like you, often have a heart that's like anger or a heart that's drunk, and they say whatever they want to say without filter. And, and, and what Jesus is teaching them in this, this moment of persecution is to don't be so offended by what they say, but listen to what they're saying and learn from what your enemies are saying about you, because oftentimes there's some nuggets that you can grow from in the midst of those who hate you. Anyone in here, let me see your hand, if you've ever had 360 feedback in your corporation. Let me see your hands. 360 feedback. You know what that is? 360 feedback. Huh? 360 feedback, Perkins, tell me if this is correct. It's, 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 an, it's a tool for evaluation where anonymously people who report to you evaluate you, people who you report to evaluate you, peers evaluate you, and then a fourth group of people outside the organization evaluate you. And it's all supposed to be confidential. And so you get a 360 panoramic view of how you are. And let me tell you, I've gone through that before when I was in corporate, and I go through it every Sunday when I greet you all. You guys give me a 360 review. <laughs> and I don't know if it should be, how many of y'all have had that before? Let me see. Let me see your hands. 360. How many of y'all say it's painful? Let me see. It's painful. But how many of y'all have learned a lot? Jesus is so incredibly wise. He says, don't be so afraid to hear what your, criticism, what, your criti your, what your critics have to say. Because God can bless you with a word even from your enemies. And that you can grow and you can develop and you can learn and you can become more mature by listening to what critics say about you. Come on, somebody. And if more than one critic is saying it, it might be true. So you can't be so sensitive because God allows us to grow through pain and through turmoil and through conflict. And oftentimes, the conflict is within ourselves. And when we hear our enemies con uh, um, criticize us, we must stop and have a moment of self-reflection. I want to give you all a homework assignment, then I'm going to close this thing out. Homework assignment is have an honest conversation with someone who you think don't like you. Ask them, how can you, what do you think you can do to improve yourself? <laughs> and the second assignment, do not curse. <laughs> Bless. And do not curse. Let me close with this. Let me close with this, because I think y'all can't handle much much more of this. I, I just, there, there was a bumper sticker on the back of a car that was broken down. And the bumper sticker said this, don't hunk, help me push. Perkins, I don't know, I ain't getting no help today, man. I usually... I used to have Miss Lizzie sitting up through there, and she would at least give me an amen, and maybe she's somewhere else today, but I ain't getting nothing today. Please listen to me. I'm closing on this. I'm going home on this. The bumper sticker says, don't honk. Help me push. Many people are broken, and the last thing we need is someone to yell at us, to judge us, to beat us up. What we need is someone to get out the comfort of their automobile, comfort of their life, the comfort of their situation, and get out and push. We need some folks, when we lose a loved one, to get up, get out, and push. We need folks 
when we're a single parent trying to just make it, not judge us because we had a baby out of wedlock or because we got a divorce. Get out your comfort zone. Stop honking at me and push. Help me move down the road. There's nothing more frustrating than to be in a vehicle that can't go nowhere. That was designed to move, designed to go, designed to carry, but it can't go, it ain't carrying, and it ain't moving. And you're going to yell at me? Don't you think I know my car is broken? <laughs> Lastly, I want to say to you that what makes us distinct is that we don't act on our emotions. We love in spite of whether we are being loved back. What makes us distinct is that we can even learn from our enemies. Because even God said, I'll make your enemies what? He says, I prepare a table in the presence of mine. We can learn from our enemies. And the last thing you all need to understand is that when you're in the presence of your enemy, not only can you love, not only can you learn, but you can laugh. You can laugh at them if they think that they can hurt you. You can laugh at them if they think that they can get the best of you. You can laugh at them if, you th if they think that they have gotten you down. Because God says all things work together for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And God has called the purpose. The world doesn't need another. I told you all this a few weeks ago. We don't need another Democrat. We don't need another Republican. We need more lovers and more learners and more laughers. I don't need you to brag about being gay or straight. I need you to brag about loving and learning and laughing. I don't need you to talk about how much money you got or don't got. It doesn't cost anything to love, to learn, and to laugh at how God does amazing things. You say, laugh? Where, how did you get to laugh? I think about Sarah. And when God said something incredible to her that she overheard, or said something incredible about her that she overheard, that at age 90 that she would give birth to a child, and she what? She laughed at the goodness and the mercy and the grace and the incredible abundance of the Lord. You all don't have to be sad. You don't have to be distressed. You don't have to be overwhelmed. Just love. Just learn and laugh how God made that thing all work out. How many of y'all know you can laugh? I laughed at when I was homeless. It's interesting. I was telling someone just the other day. I'm praying. I'm praying on this. Someone said, so, you know, I, I'm a great actor. Phyllis, I should win an Academy Award um, because... There were some folks around, Tanisha and I, not too long ago. I don't know where we were. It was not too long ago. And they said, you guys have the perfect marriage. I said, oh. Well, thank you. And I started laughing. <laughs> and they were just like, oh, my God, I want to be just like you. We're laughing the whole time. Oh, I remember where we were. We were at dinner. And, uh, and we get in a car like that. And, and we're driving home. I said, Tanisha, I said, can you believe we got them food? And she laughed. I was like, man, our stuff is all jacked up. And, and, and then, we started, then we started remembering the first few years of our marriage. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know how we made it past year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, <laughs> nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And next Monday, it'll be 22 years, 20, 20, 21. And I'm not, look, we got a month before we get to 22. I'm not sure we're going to make it, so I'm just going to... Just stay at 21. But, but, but what, what we laughed at, let me tell you what we laughed at. Our marriage was so, so jacked up the first few years. It was so painful. Neither one of us knew how to do anything right. I told you all, I was so bad, I went to the court to divorce myself. She was, <laughs> I was like, I just want to leave myself. <laughs> but those painful times, and now we laugh because we've learned, we've grown from those, 
and the things that we thought were going to destroy us are now sources of joy. And I know we can make it for the years ahead because of what has happened and what we've made it through the years past. What distinguishes us is that we're able to love those who are attacking us, that we're able to learn from the enemies, and we're able to laugh at the situations that would destroy us. Isn't that what our calling is? Isn't that what makes us distinct? 